Hi, I'm Pastor Matt Wallace from Holy Cross Lake Mary, and you're about to watch one of our sermon videos from our current sermon series, which is called Seasons. Uh, this series is broken up into sections, but overall it's going to last this entire year, and it's based on the ancient seasons of the church and the readings that the church has chosen for each Sunday during those seasons that take us through the whole biblical narrative. Now, we're located just north of Orlando in Lake Mary. If you're local, we'd love to have you come and visit with us and worship with us. But if not, we invite you to continue to watch along with this series online. If you like what you see, we would also love to have your support. And there's several ways you can do that. You can subscribe to this channel, like and share this video on Facebook or other social media. And if you're interested in giving financially, uh, to support us, you can do so at hclm.org forward slash give. And that link will be located for you below in the description. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy it. Good morning again. Uh, our sermon text for this morning is the epistle lesson uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, the other day I was uh, sitting at home, and uh, we have a pretty tight-knit uh, neighborhood, and so we're, we're good at keeping an eye out on what's going on in the neighborhood. And so I noticed a strange car a in front of my house. And, uh, and so I was kind of looking out the window, kind of seeing what was up, and it, it very quickly became apparent to me that uh, they had just made a wrong turn uh, because they were in the process of turning around. And they were executing uh, uh, what is called a, a K turn. You guys remember that, right? So, uh, you know, you kind of, you, you, you turn and then you back this way and then kind of go like that, except they weren't doing it anywhere near as smoothly as I just did it uh, with my hand. Uh, it was super awkward. They kept going back and forth. It reminded me of that old scene in Austin Powers where he gets the, he gets like the golf cart stuck sideways in the, in the hallway. Do you guys remember that? And so I'm watching them execute this awkward K turn uh, to uh, turn around and, and exit back out of, uh, you know, off of our street. Uh, when it occurred to me uh, something that is going to be the big uh, plot twist to this whole story, which is that we live on a cul-de-sac. Um, and, and so literally all they had to do was drive like 20 more feet past my house and there was a cul-de-sac they could have just turned around in uh, and been on their merry way. And uh, it just made me realize that we very often overcomplicate things uh, in our lives. We very often take something that should be really simple and relatively easy, uh, and we overthink it, or we miss something important, or we place the importance kind of on the wrong thing, and, uh, and we, we end up doing something silly, like uh, executing this awkward maneuver in our car when we could just literally drive in a circle uh, instead and be done with it. And I think uh, in the text today from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul is telling us that we often do that uh, with our faith as well, uh, that we often tend to overcomplicate things and overthink things. If you look, um, if you look at the Old Testament, you go to the Old Testament, and we have Moses. Uh, Moses goes up uh, to the top of Mount Sinai, and he speaks with the Lord, and the Lord gives him how many commandments? Ten, Ten commandments, right? And so he comes down uh, with the two tablets and gives the people the Ten Commandments. Well, later, uh, rabbis would go back, and they would comb through all the writings of Moses, all the writings of the Torah, and they would identify not Ten Commandments, but 613 different commandments. And so now we've gone from 10 to 613. And then a little later after that, the Pharisees came along. And the Pharisees said to themselves, you know, it's very important that people keep these 613 commandments. And so we want to help them. And so they had what 
at the time seemed like a genius idea. They said, we're going to build a hedge around the law, a metaphorical hedge, you know, and uh, this metaphorical hedge are going to be all these other rules that they have to follow. And uh, if, the people, if the people follow those rules, they will never get close to violating the 613 commandments that are in uh, the Torah. And so now we've gone to, from, six, from 10 to 613 to now hundreds more uh, around those things. And it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember um, uh, when I was uh, working as a corrections officer, or as I often like to say, when I was in prison, uh, I um, remember that the, the prison that I worked at, uh, we, we had a lot of really kind of, I mean, nitpicky, petty rules. And, uh, and, if, and if the inmates violated those rules, we'd, we'd write them up, we'd give, it was called an infraction. And, uh, and the, the inmates used to get so angry about that because they viewed the rules as being so petty. Uh, and so what happened, though, was they got so busy uh, kind of worrying about those little petty rules that it cut down on sort of more of the major uh, violations that were in there. So it can work. And so the Pharisees, I know we always call, kind of think of them as the villains, but they really were trying to do the right thing by creating this hedge around the law. But as we discovered when Jesus came, what they really ended up doing was they ended up putting a burden on the people. Uh, it just became a burden on the people, all these essentially man-made rules uh, on top of what were kind of some God-given uh, commandments. Uh, and it was just too much for the people. It was so complicated, there was no way uh, there was no way that they could possibly keep them. And so everyone struggled. Now it's easy to pick on kind of the Old Testament and to say, yeah, we're Christians. Uh, we've, we've been set free uh, from that. Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And that is true. And yet I find we tend to do the exact same things. We tend to do the exact same things. And sorry, guys, everyone, I know everyone's allergies. I'm like up here like this. My nose is so itchy. Uh, but we're not doing communion, so, you know, it won't. I'm not. Uh, and there's hand sanitizer at the back. I'll hit it before I shake all your hands. So, but sorry, because I just noticed I'm up here like this every, every like three seconds. But uh, <laughs> we do the same thing, though. Uh, you can look at places, and uh, we, we tend to do kind of the same idea of this hedge around the law a lot of times. When we, when we ask ourselves the question, okay, so what is the Christian life supposed to look like? How am I supposed to live as a Christian? You know, what is it okay for me to be involved in? What should I not be involved in? And these sort of things. And we begin to come up with these, you know, kind of rules. You know, we begin to think like, okay, as a Christian, I should probably dress this certain way. Uh, as a Christian, I should probably talk this certain way. As a Christian, I should probably carry myself this certain way. And maybe those things are kind of based on what we read in Scripture, but they're not really there. And we end up kind of making them as rules, and we begin to pride ourselves on doing those things, and we begin to maybe look down on other people that don't do those things. This is, I'm about to hit you with kind of an extreme example. I don't think anyone here does this, but did you know there are, for example, some churches that believe women should only wear like dresses and skirts? Uh, and, you know, and for them, that is something like that, hey, if you're really a Christian, this is how you should dress if you're a woman and a, and a Christian. If you're a man, you definitely should not dress that way, they would say, right? <laughs> so no, no kilts for you guys. Uh, uh, yeah, and you know, it, it's easy to pick on that, uh, kind of like it's easy to pick on the Old Testament, but we often do that not just with kind of extreme things, but even with things that are actually good. When we look at this text, uh, this text that the Apostle Paul is writing, he mentions a lot of things that are good things. Uh, many of them are actual gifts. You know, he mentions uh, speaking in tongues. Uh, he mentions prophecy. Uh, he mentions faith itself. 
Uh, he does mention uh, kind of some behavioral things. He mentions being giving. He mentions being self-sacrificing to the point of even your very life. Uh, those are all definitely good things. Uh, and yet, what the Apostle Paul discovered was that the people in Corinth were elevating those things too highly. That they were taking these things that were good gifts of God, and they were saying that this is what the Christian life is really all about. It's about speaking in tongues. It's about prophesying. It's about making sure that you are a super spiritual Christian. It's about making sure we are giving. It's about making sure we are self-sacrificing. And they were beginning to brag and to boast in those things. And we are not immune to that uh, today. Uh, again, you know, there are some churches, they're usually uh, charismatic churches, that will teach or tell you that uh, if you're a real genuine Christian, you, you should speak in tongues. And that if you don't, you're probably not a real, genuine Christian. And, you know, even for us, you know, the thing I always like to point out, whenever I, if I say something that's a little critical of another church, another denomination, I always like to turn that back on us. You know, one of the other things that we prize, especially here in the, in the Lutheran church, and it's something else that's mentioned in this list the Apostle Paul gives us, is knowledge. Oh man, we love that. How well do you know your scripture? You know, what, how many verses can you quote by memory? How well do you know your theology? Do you know what the gainus myostaticum is? Paul? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Don't feel bad, Paul. I also, when I realized I wanted to use that, I also looked it up to be sure I had it right. By the way, the gainus myostaticum, which is uh, uh, some kind of Latin, I think, uh, is when uh, the divine attributes are applied to a human, and it, we use that to talk about the nature of Christ, how he was both divine and human at the same time. That's the gainus myostaticum. Now you know. And we love to take pride in that stuff man, in, in our church. You know, we, we love to have that, you know, elevate that, that knowledge of scripture, that knowledge of theology. But is that what is important? If we're going to ask and answer the question, what's the most important thing about being a Christian? Or, or what does the Christian life really look like? Is that the answer? I mean, no, no, it's not the answer at all. The Apostle Paul is very clear here. The answer is not any of those things. And it's not to say that they're not good. Uh, I, I, again, many of those things, they're spiritual gifts. They're actually gifts that God gives us. Of course, they're good. But that's not what being Christian is all about. What it's all about is quite simply love. The Apostle Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. All those things, there can be good gifts of God, but when we elevate them too highly, when we make them the most important thing, we are missing out because the most important thing is love. The Apostle Paul goes on to say, uh, of these three remain faith, hope, and love. And we love that. Faith, hope, and love, it's great. We put it on plaques and on memes and on paintings, and we hang it on our walls, and we love that. Faith, hope, and love. But most times we leave off the last part, which says, and the greatest of these is love. Love is even greater than faith and hope. And I'll tell you, when I was younger, I used to kind of struggle with that a little bit, uh, especially the faith part. I'd be like, how can love 
be greater than faith. Because isn't faith what saves us? We're saved by faith alone. And isn't being saved the most important thing? And so if faith saves us and being saved is the most important thing, how can love be more important? But I was getting a few things wrong. First of all, I, I had this view that the Christian life uh, was only or mostly uh, about being saved. Uh, and to be honest, it's not. Um, I mean, that's a huge part of it, obviously. But there is so much more to it than just that. And we also have to think about, even though, of course, it's true to say we're saved by faith, the Apostle Paul himself will say it in his writings. But is that really where salvation comes from? Think uh, for a moment, uh, if, if I were to ask you, what is the greatest, like what verse, what statement uh, is the greatest proclamation of the gospel in all scripture? John 3.16, John 3.16, which hammers home that we are saved by faith. Wait, no, it doesn't. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It all stems from love. Even the faith that we have, that receives that love, that receives that grace, that receives that forgiveness, is itself a gift that God gives us out of love. It all starts with love. And there's another reason why love is the greatest uh, of all those three, faith, hope, and love. Because not only does it all begin with love, but it also all ends with love. In verses 8, 9, and 10, Paul says, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. What he's saying is this, faith is believing in that which we do not see. A day will come when we see it. Hope is believing that you will receive that which you do not yet have. A day will come when we have it. And so when we see, we will not need faith. When we have it, we will not need hope but we will always have love. This is what the Christian life is all about. It's really quite simple. And Jesus recognized this. Jesus had a wonderful way of simplifying things. Jesus came and he began to break down that hedge around the law that was putting a burden on the people. Jesus came and he began to point people back to the things that really mattered, not all those 613 things. And eventually, Jesus even reduced the Ten Commandments down to two. When he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And again, he made it about love. He said, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, that sums up the whole law. And then you could even make the argument that eventually he reduced that even down to one when he said this in John 13, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. See, it all began with him and his love for us. God so loved the world, he sent his son Jesus. And as Jesus uh, loved us enough to come and to sacrifice himself and to rise again and to live a perfect life for us. And having been loved ourselves in such a magnificent way, we are now reminded that we are to have that same love from other, 
for other people. We have uh, amazing gifts from God. Yeah, it, tongues is great. Prophecy is great. Those spiritual gifts are wonderful. Faith, of course, is a foundation of who we are. But ultimately, it's all about love. And none of that other stuff would matter if we did not have love. So don't overcomplicate things. Uh, don't, don't keep running around in circles. Don't make that awkward K turn when there's a cul-de-sac right there for you to turn around in, right? Keep it simple. Keep your focus on love, on God's love for you and on sharing that love with others. And I think you'll find that most times everything else then tends to fall into place. And in Jesus' name, amen.